Hello, everybody, to another video lecture. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the screen now. Okay, so in this um, lecture, lesson, video lesson, um, we're going to be looking at another long run uh, process of social change, which can be summed up in this idea of what it means to become civilized, right? So we have this general idea that, um, you know, the world or parts of the world are more civilized today than they were in the past. You know, this is sometimes summed up in this idea of the civilization process, the process in which humans have become more civilized. So the question then, the first question really is, well, what do we mean by that, right? What do we mean by becoming more civilized? So um, the way I get at this usually in, in class is um, I show some pictures um, throughout history. Um, so one of the first pictures I show is uh, these Roman toilets um, from about 100 BCE, right? Um, and so you, these are some kind of classical, uh, classic Roman toilets. And so, you know, I ask people, okay, well, what do we notice about these toilets, uh, these public toilets that are different from the public toilets today? So if you look at a picture, you know, one of the first things you notice is that there's no dividing wall. Right? So here's kind of a, a painting here uh, of, the, of the Romans using the toilets, right? And so what we see here is that people are using the toilets, they're defecating uh, in front of everybody else, right? And that this is something that we would almost consider impossible today in Western industrialized world, right? That we would consider this very shameful, right? We would consider this embarrassing, right? This idea that the Romans, you kind of openly uh, performed a bodily function of defecating um, that we would now consider to be embarrassing to be done in front of other humans. Another example, right? So we see this picture here, uh, a painting or drawing uh, from about the uh, 15th century in Europe, right? So it's a kind of a, a drawing of a typical courtly scene, right? Kind of upper class people hang out and it's a drawing of, of what their, their life is like. And so again, we can ask, well, what's unique or what's maybe a little bit surprising in this photo or drawing? Um, so we, we see some monkeys, maybe that's surprising, but actually it's um, the bathing scene that is surprising, right? So the, the bottom right, we see people bathing, right? Out in public. And what we see is nakedness, right? People going in and being in the bath uh, in front of other people in a public scene and they're, they are naked, right? They're not wearing clothes. And so again, this is, would be for most people, most times, um, you know, embarrassing or shameful that you wouldn't just appear out in public in front of other people, you know, without clothes on. But still we see in Europe at this time, you know, the idea of doing this was considered uh, normal, right? So we see this, you know, we, you know, See this here in this kind of large scene for the picture here, right? People kind of nakedly bathing in front of each other. Or we even see it here in the early, even, you know, kind of progressing through history, we see it um, in um, these objects here that are on the floor, right? So this is a bar scene from just the turn of the century, right? Um, it's like 1901, I think. Um, so it's a Western saloon. And we can ask, well, what are those things on the floor? Like what are they doing on the floor there? What are they? So if you don't know, these are spittoons, right? These are buckets in which people would spit into, right? And so again, we would think of this as disgusting, right? Imagine you're hanging out in your living room or your house or a restaurant or a bar, and, you know, there's a bucket of spit in front of you, right? And everybody is spitting, you know, into it. And the interesting thing is these people actually thought that what they were doing was more civilized, right? So the question is, you know, what would people do before spittoons? You know, what did people do with their spit, you know, before there was a bucket of spit to spit into? They would just spit onto the floor, 
right? They would just spit, you know, wherever they wanted to. People were spitting all the time, right? And so they actually thought they were being more civilized, right? That the, the, having spittoons was something more classy uh, than just spitting on the floor. But now we can think of it, now we think of spittoons as kind of gross and disgusting, right? Um, or a more recent uh, photo, right? So this is um, uh, toilets in Japan in the 21st century, right? And so what do we notice about these toilets in Japan? These, these are public toilets, right? They have these buttons you can press um, that will do various things for you. But one of the things that we'll do is they make a sound, right? They'll make a musical sound or like a white noise sound. Right, so why are people doing this? Because they want to cover up the sound of their normal human bodily function of going to the bathroom. Right now, they found they people find sounds coming from the bathroom to be embarrassing or shameful. Right, and so the idea is to look how far we have progressed. Right, we have progressed from people in Rome defecating openly in front of each other, right, and not really being embarrassed or shamed by it to even the sounds of going to the bathroom, you know, being shameful. Right? And so this is really what we mean by civilization. It is a process in which we are now more watching of our behavior, right? We are more controlled in how we act, particularly over our bodily functions, right? We are more controlled in terms of how we use our body particularly bodily functions like going to the bathroom, right? Or even spitting, right? We're more reserved, right? We're more controlled in our actions. And along with this, we're more embarrassed and ashamed if we do something that is, you know, not proper, right? Not something that we consider not to be correct or right. You know, we're now have this feeling of shame or embarrassment. And so what we can see here is being civilized is not just a positive or good thing. So when we say civilized, I'm not saying it's good to be civilized. I'm not saying it's bad either, but I'm saying it's simply a process in which humans in certain parts of the world, namely the West, right, Europe, uh, America, Japan, have become more controlled in their actions and in their public behavior, um, have been and uh, now watch the way that they act. And so this is generally what we can think of as the civilization process or the civilizing process, the process of becoming more and more civilized over time. And so in today's lesson, I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to, I'm going to more fully describe this process of civilization, right? Show how it's something that has occurred over hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's a very slow moving process. And then I'm going to talk about the cause of it. Like, why are we becoming more civilized? And then thirdly, talk about what it has done to us, how it actually has made us more lonely in the modern world. And so rather than actually seeing civilization as being a positive, there are certain ways that we can actually see it as a negative, something that's um, detrimental to the way that we live. Um, just so everybody knows, um, this whole theory is based off of the work of Norbert Elias here, this cool guy with his cool glasses. Um, he's a German sociologist um, who uh, uh, wrote um, in, actually wrote in Germany in the, like the 1920s, 1930s, but had to flee Germany um, in the rise of Nazi, uh, the Nazi Germanys, and then uh, uh, did his work mostly in Britain after that. And so it's really based on his work, the civilizing process. Okay, so let's talk about what the civilizing process is, right? So as I have mentioned, in general, it's a process in which people have been, become more controlled in their public behaviors and in which they have watched the way that they have acted and tried to act in a way that is more um, acceptable, right? It's a growing process of self-control is what we can generally say. So Elias examined how, you know, there was this increasing degree of self-control over history by looking at etiquette books. So he looked at, he really wanted, he examined etiquette and manners. 
these kind of small rules of behavior, what we might be called informal folk ways, right? You know, so the correct way to hold a fork, how to talk to people saying please and thank you. You know, this is what we generally consider to be um, etiquette and manners, the niceties of uh, social life, right? Being nice and polite to people. And so what he wanted to trace and what he did trace was how etiquette and manners developed over hundreds and hundreds of years in Europe. So how did he do this? He looked at etiquette books, right? And so etiquette books have been around for a long, long time, since the Middle Ages. These are books, documents that give people advice about how they should act, right? The correct way of acting, right? This was more popular in the earlier times, you know, but it's still around, you know, how to have a wedding, um, you know, how to, uh, you know, um, do an interview. What we now consider them is kind of a version of self-help books, you know, books in which you're supposed to improve your life and improve your existence uh, to other people, right? Um, and so, you know, these etiquette books have been around and they still are around in various forms. And so what Elias did, he traced the advice that etiquette books did um, gave from the Middle Ages over time, All right? So let's look at some of these advice, All right? So this is advice that appeared in the etiquette books, manners books uh, from the 1400s onwards, All right? So one of the first things he noticed is, oh, this piece of advice here, it's unseemly to blow your nose into a tablecloth, All right? So we have to imagine, okay, what were people doing, All right? They were having dinner in their mannerly house, right? Um, you know, and they were having, I don't know, roast chicken or something like that, and, you know, in front of all the lords, you know, in some big, you know, fire, you know, the fire or something like that. And, you know, people were just grabbing the tablecloth and just, you know, you know blowing their nose on it, right? And just going for it, right? And at some point people were like, oh, that's, that's not, that's disgusting. That's gross. You know, you can't do that. It suggests that before people were just doing this openly, right? Just, they didn't think about it. They didn't think of it as shameful or bad. You know, they just think, thought about it as they had to blow their nose, right? Here's, I kind of picked out kind of uh, pieces of advice that I thought was funny and humorous, right? So after people started blowing the nose on the tablecloth, they did something civilized, right? They invented the handkerchief, right? This piece of cloth that you, you know, kept around with you and that was specifically there to blow your nose. Like that's very civilized, right? So you're not just blowing your nose on your shirt or your pants or the tablecloth. Now you have this piece of fabric, the handkerchief that you would just there to blow your nose on. That's more polite, that's mannerly. But with the invention of this civilized thing, you now had to instruct people how to use it, right? And so one piece of advice was, you know, after you blow your nose into the handkerchief, don't look into it, right? Don't open it up and look into it, uh, expecting to find like pearls or rubies. I find it kind of funny, right? And so the idea here is, you know, who would we normally think that we had to tell this to? Children, right? This is kind of advice that you have to tell children, right? Don't pick your nose, don't eat it off the floor, don't look at your handkerchief, right? That's gross, that's disgusting. But this is not advice for children. Right? This is advice for adults. Right? These are adult people. And they're being told not to look into, into their handkerchief. You know, that would be gross and disgusting. Right? Here's my favorite piece of advice. Right? So you can kind of go ahead and read it. And so what we imagine here is what's happening. You have two lords, right? upper class men. And they're walking down a city street somewhere or they're walking in the castle and they see some um, dog shit on the ground. And they're like, oh, this is so fascinating. And one guy goes and picks up the dog shit and is like, takes a good whiff of it and then shows it to his friend and says, oh, this is really disgusting and smelly. You know, you should smell it, right? And, you know, so the, this advice is saying, don't do that, you know, right? That's disgusting, that's gross. And this is, you know, again, this is amazing to us. It's amazing to think that anybody would even have to be given this advice. Like, why are people being told not to pick up dog poop, right? Who's picking up dog poop? 
but presumably these people were, right? And so again, you know, this thing that we now consider to be incredibly disgusting, feces, dog poop, is something that people weren't so ashamed of. They're like they would touch it, they would hold it, they would smell it. And so it's over time that we see this advice being given to saying, hey, look, there are now things that are disgusting and gross that you should not do. Don't blow your nose on a tablecloth. Don't look at your handkerchief. Don't pick up dog poop, right? Or again, don't be urinating in the castle stairway, right? Don't just go into a room and start urinating, right? And so again, you know, this is advice that we you think you'd have to tell children, right? But no, it's, it's not, it's, these are adults. And so what we see is a gradual increasing control over bodily functions, right? You know, you urinate in bathrooms, right? Um, you know, you don't just be gross and disgusting in front of people. The whole idea of being gross and disgusting is something that has developed over time, that idea. Right, so don't jam, you know, see, you know, again, more advice about noses, don't jam your finger up your nose in front of other people and then eat it, right? Again, we think of this disgusting. We think of this as only stuff that um, children need to be told, right? Um, again, what we see here is the advice becoming more and more specific, right? Now it's like, you know, don't even, when you unfold your handkerchief, you know, when you use it, be polite. Don't let other people see it. Right? And again, the important thing here is you're being polite for other people. It's not about yourself so much anymore, but it's about, you know, be polite for others, be nice to others. This is really the idea of etiquette and manners. It's not about you. It's about being polite to other people, getting along and being nice to other people. We'll see that this is really important, right? And so what we see here overall is the growth of proper forms of behavior, being polite, being mannerly, right? Um, you know, the right way to address people, the correct way to talk, control over bodily functions. And so the idea here is that this was first taught to the lords and ladies, the upper classes, right? You know, you think of people in the castle, right? And then eventually it spread to the rest of society. Right now, everybody was expected to follow the standard of behavior, you know, the middle classes and the lower classes. And a lot of it is, you know, control over bodily function. You know, even now it's like burping or, you know, barking, you know, it's controlling how our body appears to other humans. And so this is, you know, this is a big part of it, right? Control over etiquette and manners. A good example of this is silverware. Right, an invention, a, 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 an invention of civilization. Right? And so the question is, you know, why do we use silverware? This is what the reading was about for today. You know, why do we use it? You know, some things we need to use silverware, right? It's hard to eat soup without a spoon, right? It's hard to eat some rice without a fork or chopsticks, right? And so, but the question is, well, what about other types of food like roast chicken or a steak, right? Why can't you just pick up a steak with your hand and to start chewing into it. You know, particularly, you know, you go to a nice restaurant, you order a steak, you know, a nice steak. Why can't you just pick that up and start eating it with your hands? The reason is not because of any practical reason, but because we consider it disgusting, right? That it's, we think of it as gross and shameful to eat food with your hands. And so we invented forks and knives to be polite right? To not put our own fingers in our hands, but to be, you know, have, you know, pick it up with a fork and put it into our mouth, right? The whole process of eating in front of other humans is one that is a risk of being disgusting, right? You know, seeing people chew their food, you know, talking while chewing is something we consider to be gross, right? And so it's this whole process of becoming more manly and controlled again in this bodily function, it's all about things entering the body and things leaving the body, right? And now we find particularly in nice restaurants, right? Or a fancy restaurant that's very complicated. There's a whole set of rules, you know, which fork to use, which wine glass gets the wine, the water glass and the right red wine, the white wine, the, 
you know, salad fork and the dessert fork and a napkin, right? All this shows how complicated we have made eating, right? It used to be that eating was just a biological function that we needed to do to keep ourselves alive. But now we have made it into this very, very complicated process in which there are salad forks, right? And it's all, you know, it's a, there's a lot of manners and etiquette involved. And, and if you break the rules, now you've done something, you know, uh, shameful or disgusting or, you know, um, not correct, you know, improper, right? So it's control over, you know, our behaviors, but it's also, it's something more than that, right? It's also the development of a feeling right? It's the development of feelings of disgust and shame, right? And so I hear here is, you know, it's not that people before were disgusting. It's not that people in the early middle ages did things that were shameful. They had no ideas of disgust. They had no ideas of shame. So the guys going and picking up dog poop off the ground, they didn't do, they weren't doing something disgusting because they had no idea of disgust or they had less of an idea of disgust. But over time, these feelings, feelings of something being gross, something being embarrassing, something being shameful, is something that, that has developed and grown in us, right? So those feelings of disgust and shame are not a, a feeling that all people at all times have had, but rather it's a modern feeling a feeling that people have developed over time. You know, a good example, this is, you know, think about what it feels like when you see a child pick their nose, like it's gross, right? You see some kid picking their nose, you know, in public and you're like, oh, that's disgusting, right? Um, the kid doesn't know it's disgusting, but we feel disgusted when, when we see that. An important aspect of this whole process is what Elias describes as a process in which social control becomes self-control, right? And we saw this when we talked about, um, you know, uh, formal sanctions and internal sanctions. There's a little bit of a, a similarity here. Okay, so what is social control? Social control is when you are controlled externally, right? Somebody else is controlling your behavior. Right, you somebody, you know, you're you're supposed to follow the norms. Don't be deviant, and to do that, you're you're being exerted social control on you. Somebody else is telling you what to do. Right, so your parents will punish you. Uh, people will give you a bad look. A police officer will give you a fine. Right, and so all that is social control. What Elias says is, over time, what happens is that social control becomes self-control it becomes internalized it's no longer that somebody has to force us to do the right thing from the outside but over time we just force ourselves right we it, this social control this external control becomes internalized and so he has a quote actually and we think about this as a process of socialization right it's a process in which children learn the rules and the rules become internalized inside of them, right? And so, you know, children forget this, right? They, you know, earlier in time, children, young children, they experience shame and embarrassment by not doing the right thing. Their parents said, don't do that. No, oh, that's gross, that's disgusting. You know, don't, don't eat food off the ground or don't pick your nose. And, you know, and their parents helped give them this feeling of shame or embarrassment. But this was external, this was put upon them. But over time, what happens is this became an internal feeling, right? This external punishment, this external shame became an internal feeling of guilt, right? And so Elias says it nicely, right? The social standard to which an individual was first made to confirm from the outside by external restraint is reproduced more or less smoothly through self-restraint, right? And so, you know, uh, social control becomes uh, self-control. But what, so what Elias is saying is, okay, normally we think of this as the process of socialization. This is what happens to a child as they grow up. The child experiences social control, 
And then that social control eventually becomes internalized until it becomes self-control. And then the child becomes an adult. But what Elias is saying is that this is not just about the life of a child or a person. This is about the growth of an entire society, right? That over time, over hundreds and hundreds of years, this same process happened to society, right? In the Middle Ages, it was external social control. People were told what to do. Don't eat, don't pick up the poop off the ground. Um, don't blow your nose on the tablecloth. But then over time, society became more and more self-controlled until we now just all know not to do these things, right? It becomes automatic, right? So social control becomes self-control. Okay, so, so far it can seem like the civilization process is something mm, petty. Like it, it's about little things like blowing your nose or not farting or, you know, um, you know, not picking dog poop off the ground. It's about etiquette and manners and not being gross. But Elias says, no, it's actually more than that. It's how humans have learned to control their emotions, right? That, and that, that again, this is not just something that happens from a child to an adult, but this is something that happens over hundreds and hundreds of years, right? And so what he says is that over time, people, society, have learned to have a greater degree of control over their feelings, over their emotions, right? So feelings of anger, feelings of sadness, feelings of even happiness, right? You know, uncontrollable fits of humor, right? Or dancing or laughing, right? So that in the Middle Ages, people were a lot more exuberant, right? They were a lot more expressive of their feelings. They were, they were easily to get angry. They were easily to get... Uh, sad, you know, people cried openly, people laughed hysterically. But that over time, over hundreds and hundreds of years, up until the 20th and 21st century, now people are much more controlled in their emotions. They're much more careful in expressing their feelings, right? You know, they're less likely to cry openly, less likely to laugh hysterically, less likely to get angry in front of other humans. And so that we have all become more and more controlled in the expressions of our feelings, less open with our feelings, right? And that this has something that has happened over hundreds and hundreds of years. I think a best good example, this is like crying. You know, now it's, I think it's pretty rare to see people crying in public, right? You know, uh, it's not that people are not sad, right? It's not that people don't get bad news, but it's that when they get bad news or they're sad for some reason, they hold it in. They control their feelings. And I think part of the reason is, you know, what does it seem like when somebody does cry in public? Right? You see somebody crying at a restaurant or crying in a coffee shop. You're like, oh, that's, you know, that's sad. You know, you feel bad for the person, but you also feel embarrassed. It's awkward. Like, oh, I wish they would stop crying, right? And so it's not, you know, that natural feeling of crying, that natural feeling of feeling sad and expressing that feeling is now something shameful, something that you shouldn't really do in public. You know, you should cry in a bathroom or something like that. And so we have learned as a society, as a group of people, to become more and more restrained in the expression of our feelings. We cry less in public. Another good example of this is think about open arguments. You know, think about um, what it's like to see people arguing in, in public. So people shouting at each other or people, you know, having some dispute, right? It's, I would say it's actually pretty rare or less common, right? It's less common to see people getting angry, right? Um, again, it's something that people do behind closed doors. They control themselves and they say, oh, we can't argue here. You know, let's, let's go argue in private, right? And so what we see is people becoming more and more restrained in the expression of their feelings. I think a good example of this to show you how important it is, it's actually not just expression of feelings, but it's actually a restraint in our behaviors. It's a decrease in violence, right? And so the, the way to think about this is over time, society has become less and less violent. One way to think about this is that 
um, the Middle Ages were very, very violent, right? The Middle Ages in Europe were incredibly violent. The murder rate was like 10 times as high as it is now. Uh, people killed each other, people assaulted each other, people did sexual assault at a rate that we would find incredibly upsetting, right? So people were very, 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 very violent, right? Um, people murdered and killed. Um, poisoning was a very common thing that, that, you know, somebody annoyed you, somebody offended you, you really hated them. Uh, so you would go poison them and kill them, right? Another thing that was popular was blood feuds, right? Um, so for example, what would happen was, you know, you would have two families, you know, in some town and they didn't like each other. And, you know, say two people had a dispute and one person killed the other person. Like, oh, okay. Then what would the, what would the family of the dead person do? they would go and kill a family member of that person, right? And then the, that, that family would go back and kill another person. Like people, and this happened very, really commonly, right? People were, were killing each other all the time, right? So um, killing was pretty common, you know, assaults, violence, stuff like this. We can see examples of uh, things that we would find, we find, you know, we just don't understand now. Uh, the burning of witches is a good example. Right, so in the Middle Ages, around 1600s, 1700s, um, there was this idea that there were these witches, women, right? And um, you know, they were evil and they were in league with the devil. And uh, in Europe, what they would do is they would burn them alive, right? They would get the person, the human being, they would tie them to a pyre, uh, they would light that pyre on fire, and the person would burn alive in front of everybody. So no matter what you would think about like witches or not, or, you know, we, we find the idea of witches being real, uh, you know, hard to I, imagine, but just let's say we accept that. What's even harder to imagine now is well, now we're gonna burn a person alive in front of us and we're not gonna really have a real problem in this, right? We're, it's not, we're not gonna be horrified. We're not gonna be shocked. Well, maybe we're gonna be shocked a little bit, but we're not gonna be ter like, it's not gonna be something that we stops us from doing it. In some ways, people are actually going to enjoy it, right? They're going to see that person burn alive and they're going to get something positive out of it, a good experience. But it shows you, again, this is an example of how violent people were. Uh, people used to burn other humans alive. Another really good example of this, um, more recent, is how we treated animals, and how we still treat animals, but we're, we were more public, we're more public about it then, right? So, um, you know, this idea that um, a, a popular thing to do in uh, the summer solstice, the longest day of the year during the summer um, in Europe was you would get a whole bunch of cats, right? So you would run around the town, um, you would get all the stray cats that were there, you would put them in a bag um, and you would burn them alive. Like you would dump them on a fire, right? And again, it just shows you that, you know, people didn't think anything wrong about this. It's not that they were, it's not that they were trying to do something terrible. They didn't think of it as terrible. Violence and harm against living animals and living people was a thing that was just pretty common. Over the 20th century and over the 21st century, our rate of violence has incredibly decreased. Some hard, sometimes this is hard to understand because you know, with the news media, it can sometimes seem as if things are more violent. You, you see about you know, cities like Chicago or you know, places like that, you're like, oh, this is really violent. But actually, overall, on average, the rate of homicide and assaults has fallen you know, in the last 40 or 50 years by like 30 or 40%, right? We are much less violent today than we were in the past. And so why? Because we have more control over our emotions. Right? We have more control over our anger, right? We know we can't just be violent. You can't just punch somebody. You can't just assault them. We are more and more controlled over our feelings. And now society is more, uh, is more pacified. Um, what's interesting is there's, with this development of, in, of an increasing level of control, what we then also did is we created special places and special times to allow people to lose control, right? So having a high degree of control all the time is it weighs on people. It, it feels taxing. It, it's, it's something that they find too constraining. And so this level of constraint is 
tiring to people that we that they sometimes want to let loose right they want to have a place where they can lose control and so at the same time that we created a higher expectation of control over people we also provided humans with a place for them to lose control to be more emotional to be more expressive right so what what are the, what are examples of these places sports right no sports is an what's called a place of excitement it's a place where people can express themselves and get emotional right so you think of a, going to a sports match people are shouting people are screaming people are painting their faces right people get really energized and emotional about their team right an idea here is that we created sports to allow an avenue through which people to express their emotions and to express their you know their uh, you know to lose control right what else bars and parties right you know going to a bar on friday night you know getting intoxicated um you, drinking too much alcohol you know this is a way for people to lose control right to allow themselves to uh escape even temporarily the heavy degree of constraint that is expected in everyday life right so you know and we allow alcohol in some sense to be excuse you're like oh well, i drank so much and that made me lose control right but it, it was really in some sense it's a, it's a desire to be uncontrolled that humans still have so drinking too much and the, this allows people to be expressive allows people to dance to be emotional you know, we can even think of dancing as a way of people to express themselves right to lose you know to do use their body to uh, to have an emotion right so bars also house parties and this is furthered by the use of certain substances you know alcohol and other drugs are things that humans now use to allow themselves to lose control to escape um the constraint of everyday life. But an important thing is it, it, you have to do it at a special time, a special place, right? It has to be like Friday or the weekend, right? You can't be getting intoxicated on Monday at, in the middle of the day, right? And so we have special times, special places in which we allow people temporarily to lose control because their normal everyday life is so heavily controlled. Another example of this, unboxing, right? You know, we, we created this whole sport in which people would be violent towards each other. Men typically would be violent towards each other because we experience less violence in our everyday life, right? We, want, we now watch people punch each other because it's so rare to see people punch each other, right? You know, we created a sport out of it as a way to kind of channel this violent energy. You know, again, the idea is boxing is okay in the ring, right? We created this box, right? In which, in order to box in violence, right? You can be violent in the ring. You can punch somebody, you can hit them, um, but not outside the ring, right? Inside the ring, it's boxing. Outside the ring, it's assault, right? A special place in, in order to be violent and to allow people to see violence and to experience it. And we see even this, you know, the growth of this with um, even more violence in terms of things like UFC, right? Ultimate fighting, you know, which is even more violent uh, than traditional boxing, right? And again, there is, there is a certain degree, there is a lust for this violence. People find it exciting. People find it thrilling uh, because they're not really experiencing violence in their everyday life. And I would imagine actually that if they did experience violence in their everyday life, you know, UFC or boxing wouldn't really seem that exciting or thrilling. You know, it's only thrilling for a group of people who don't really experience everyday violence, which turns out to be not so good. You know, even something like dueling, right? Dueling is a civilized way to kill somebody, right? You're not just straight up murdering somebody, you're doing it by the rules. Right, it's a polite way to murder somebody, right? And so you're saying, "Oh, you can you can murder somebody, but you gotta have a duel. You gotta do it by the right etiquette and manners. There's a manners to killing, right? And so even dueling is a way to be polite. And then what do we do with dueling? We increased our level of control and said, "No, dueling is you can't do that. That's 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 terrible. 
you know, you can't just murder somebody. And so we see this increasing level of control. Right? And so we, we see special places to lose control, special ways to express feelings. Okay, so all of this is a civilizing process. To sum it up, it's an increasing level of control that people exert over themselves, expressed in doing the correct manners and etiquette, in having feelings of disgust and shame, in which they develop self-control, and in which they control their emotions. Okay. So now we want to go to the second part of the lesson. Now we have a sense of what the civilizing process is. Now we want to figure out well, why are we becoming more civilized, right? What, what's causing us to be more in control of ourselves? Why are we expected to be so polite? Why do we need to be so um, controlled in our behaviors? Elias actually has a pretty short answer, a short answer that is you know, complicated. And the short answer is we have become more and more interdependent, right? That as we, as society has progressed over time, people have become more and more connected together. People, humans, have become more and more dependent on each other. So if you remember all the way to our very first class, right, we described society as a network of interdependent people, a group of people who are all dependent on each other, who all need each other, even if they don't know each other, right? So the doctor who needs the police officer, the police officer who needs the teacher, the teacher who needs students, right? A, a society is a whole group of people who need each other to get things done, to have food and shelter and medical care. And so what Elias says is what has happened is that this, interde this interdependent network didn't just appear overnight, but rather it was something that grew over time, right? And so what we see here is a picture of society, right? So a whole bunch of people, some of the people are connected, some of the people are dependent. And then over time, what happens is, you know, over hundreds and hundreds of years, people grew more and more dependent, right? More and more connected, right? More and more needing each other, right? So the idea here is over time, we're forming this network. We become chained to one another, right? Whether we want to be chained or not, right? So over time, we are now entering this dense web of interdependency where humans all need each other, right? We become more and more connected. So Elias has this really nice metaphor that he talked, you know, he, he, he said in the first, very first reading from class, right? You know, it's like you're chained to one another, right? There's these invisible chains around your ankles and you're chained to the other people in your class. You're chained to the other people in your dorm. You're chained to your roommate. You're chained to your family. You're chained to your friends. You're chained to the stranger walking down the street and the other people driving their car. You're chained to all these people. Whether you like it or not, you know, you are dependent on other people and other people are dependent on you. Think of New York City, right? This place where millions and millions of people live in a very condensed space in which they all need each other. They economically need each other. Uh, they need each other to follow a certain level of rules. Uh, you know, they, people are dependent on each other, whether or not they like each other. A lot of people in New York City, maybe they don't like each other, but they still need each other. Or think about Europe, right? I showed you this map, right? Of how there used to be a lot of little states, city-states, fiefdoms. And then over time, you have these big nations grow up. France, Italy, England, Spain, right? What's happening here is these societies have all become more and more connected together. Now all the people in France are dependent on one another. They form this big national network. They need each other, they're dependent, they're interdependent. And so now it's this formation of these nations is like a formation of these dense social networks in which people are now all interconnected and all interdependent. 
Okay, so people are more interconnected. People are more interdependent. So what does that matter? Like, why does that make us more civilized? Why does that mean that we have to watch the way we act and make sure that we don't have to pick our nose? Essentially, what Elias is saying is that with a greater degree of interdependence, everybody needs to exert more self-control, right? With everybody being dependent on each other, now everybody has to get along. Everybody has to act properly, right? Now you're connected in this giant web of relationships. And so you have to get along with other people, right? You can't just get angry. You can't just get upset. You can't just hit somebody. You need a degree of self-control so that the whole web of connections stays together so it can all so that people can cooperate basically right so that more inter more interdependence means more self-control right? so it's kind of ironic in a way right the more connected we have to come together the more we need to control ourselves right and so why it's kind of he says it here in his quote not in your reading right but, you know, the denser web of interdependence becomes the more threatened the social existence of the individual who gives away to spontaneous impulses and emotions, right? So if you depend on other humans, you can't just suddenly get angry or, or, or get upset. You know, imagine you have a circle of friends and you're a person who like flips out, and gets angry sometimes. What are your friends going to do? They're going to stop being your friends, right? What do you do if you get angry at work? You know, you shout at the customers. You're going to get fired, Right. And so your existence in the world requires you to be to a certain degree controlled in your behavior, to control your emotion, to be polite, to be nice, to get along with other humans because all the humans need each other. Right. The more strongly an individual is constrained, you know, the more they're connected together. Right? And so basically the more interdependence requires more self-control, right? And as our society has become more and more interdependent, it now requires a high degree of control. We expect a lot from people. We expect people to control their feelings, to control their emotions, uh, to be ashamed if they do the wrong thing, um, to know the rules and to be polite and nice to people, right? We, we expect a high degree of, of self-control from humans and to make the whole thing work. Which leads us to, well, what does this mean then? What, what is it like to live in this type of society? What is it like to live in a society in which people are highly controlled and which people are highly interdependent? What I would argue is that it actually produces some degree of negative things, right? Creates a group of people who are very carefully watched themselves, right? So now have to be, um, watch their behavior, you know, be very careful in what they do and in what they say and what they feel. And so essentially what happens is we're, you know, the question is, have we become too polite? Are we too careful, right? Do we not say what we think because we don't want to offend somebody? Do we not express our feelings because we might feel ashamed or embarrassed? Do we keep it inside because we don't, we don't know if it's the right way to act, right? And so the question is, have we become too polite, too nice, too careful, right? You know, and is this creating a certain degree of anxiety in people, right? I, I think there's, there's a connection to here to, to the high degree of anxiety that people now feel in social situations because they worry and fear not doing the right thing. And so the question has become, you know, how we become too, um, uh, too self-controlled, right? And Elias basically says this. He says, you know, maybe, yes, the world is less dangerous. People are murdering each other less. They're not throwing cats into fires. It's a good thing, right? But along with that, maybe it's, we've lost a zest for life. Maybe we don't experience pleasure as much. Maybe we aren't as open with our feelings and connected to other humans. Maybe we, we, we aren't as lively as we used to be because we're too controlled 
in what we do and how we act. It's the last line of this quote that I find interesting. He says, for what is lacking in everyday life as a substitute is created in dreams, in books and pictures. And I think we really see this. I think that we now look for excitement, we look for pleasure, not in our real everyday life, but we look for it in popular culture. We find excitement in movies and TV shows, right? You know, think about all the action movies that we now watch, you know, that we now see violence on the screen and we see this, you know, feelings happening and it makes us feel excited because in our everyday lives, we're not that excited, right? You know, we go to work, we are controlled. And so we experience excitement. We experience the thrill of living in our fiction, right? Rather than in our reality. Same thing with sports, right? You know, maybe we experience violence in like the UFC and in boxing because in our everyday lives, we don't, we don't really experience violence, right? And so we get a false form of violence, a fictional form of violence, because we still want to experience it, but we don't experience it in reality. And so I guess, you know, the idea here is a caution, you know, a worry that I have about whether people have become too controlled in their feelings, too careful uh, in the expression of their thoughts. And the way that Elias sums it up is maybe we have become alone in a crowd, right? So now we're surrounded by lots of other people. We are dependent on lots of other, pe other people. We live in urban cities where, you know, we live around other people, but we still feel, we still have a feeling of loneliness. We feel, still have a feeling of disconnection up from all these people around us, maybe because we're too careful in how we express ourselves, right? And then, you know, summed up in this idea of alone in a crowd. You're surrounded by other people who you're dependent on, but you still have this feeling of loneliness because of your being too self-controlled. Um, I don't really have an answer for this. And I don't think, it, you know, I don't want to overstate the problem, um, but I think it's, you know, it's, an, it's something that we should think about and, and um, consider, you know, whether we are too polite and too careful with our feelings. Okay, so this, I think that's quite enough um, for today. I um, uh, hope everybody enjoys uh, Thanksgiving next week.